Our next talk is the final talk of the day, and it is a keynote by Dr. Steve Davis on the economics of change. He's going to look forward to the future. Uh, Dr. Steve Davis is the Education Director at the IEA, and he's previously the Program Officer at the Institute of Humane Studies at George Mason University in Virginia. He joined IHS from the UK, where he was Senior Lecturer in the Department of History and Economic History at Manchester Metropolitan University. Over to you, Steve Davis. Well, thanks, Grant. Well, uh, this is quite, I hope, going to be an exciting few minutes for you all, because what I'm going to tell you about is the way in which, in the next 20 years or so, the world in which you live and your own lives are going to be completely, utterly transformed by a number of innovations and technological breakthroughs, which are actually happening right now. So this is not speculation. This is not science fiction. This is things that a lot of very smart people and people who also intend to make a great deal of money out of it are working on right now. Now, if you look at the news bulletins, uh, if you follow the, uh, the news programs on television, radio, or read the press, you might think that the really important stories in the news are things like the uh, you know, farce or whatever you might call it that's going on with Greek negotiations with their creditors, uh, or the kind of stock market collapse that's going on in China right now, or the kind of political troubles that are going on in the Middle East. But actually, if you take the really long-term view, the really significant news is elsewhere. It's in the worlds of technology, the world of innovation, uh, the world of creation, where all kinds of amazing things are happening. And I'm just going to run through a few of these and then try and explain how to understand these and put them into some kind of wider context. One of them uh, is the driverless car, uh, already being worked on by Mercedes and by Google, driverless cars being trialed out in California, uh, Pauline Dixon was telling me uh, this morning that she's just been in San Francisco uh, and they're just walking along and saw one of these Google driverless cars go zooming past at 60 odd miles an hour with two people just sat in it chatting to each other, uh, obviously no driver. We're going to start trialing driverless cars in the UK uh, this year. Uh, are, I predict that they're going to be very, very rapidly adopted. Now, what kind of impact is that going to have? Well, it's actually going to be utterly and totally transformative. Google itself estimates that making very conservative assumptions with driverless cars, you can eliminate 90% of the cars on the road at the moment. You can make do with only 10% of the number of cars that we now have. That's because car utilization at the moment is unbelievably inefficient. In the United States, a driver, the owner of a car, typically only uses their car for about 5 to 7% of the time. The rest of the time, it's parked up. Uh, here in the United Kingdom, the figures are actually less than 5% because we don't have such a car-dependent society as you have in North America. Now, of course, with driverless cars, that no longer will happen. What will happen is that you will actually not, certainly not own a car. You will use something like Uber to call up a driverless car to take you somewhere, and as soon as it's dropped you off, it will zoom off somewhere else and pick up someone else. Hence, you do with far less cars. Now, just think for a moment about what that means. What it means, for example, is that the size of the highway system, without a single penny of extra capital investment, is going to effectively increase by a factor of almost 10. Uh, it means also that you can say goodbye to traffic jams not only because the number of cars will reduce dramatically, but also because these cars are going to be vastly more efficient. The smart software that runs them will mean that the cars will use junctions more efficiently, they will uh, drive at the correct speed, you won't get bunching or all the other kind of problems that are caused by incompetent or irritating drivers. Uh, it also means that a huge amount of land will be released. In the United States, in major metropolitan areas, one third of all the ground is used for parking lots. All of that real estate, or virtually all of it, would now become available. It's been estimated that that amounts to an area of land the size of Connecticut and Vermont combined. Just think about what the effect of this will be on the urban economy of the United States and, by extension, the rest of the world. And, of course, these car, driverless cars will be so much safer. 
90% of all road traffic accidents are caused by driver error, which will be effectively eliminated by switching to driverless cars and smart software. This uh, means, for example, in the United States alone, uh, 30,000 fewer deaths every year, 2 million fewer injuries every year, 4.8 billion fewer hours spent commuting and therefore not being used productively in one way or another. The reduction in cost is simply staggering. The reduction in fuel emissions, in the consumption of oil, again, of an incredible order of magnitude. Modest assumptions lead you to the conclusion that in the United States alone, if driverless cars come to be even 50% of the cars on the road, then you will get a net saving of $1.3 trillion. Uh, the effects of this, as you can imagine, are going to be simply uh, dramatic. It's going to change the whole of our economy in all kinds of ways that we can't even imagine. And of course, it's not just cars. You will also have driverless trucks. You will have uh, driverless trains, which you know, with it, we already have in most of the world's underground systems. Uh, not here in London, of course, as I'm sure many of you noticed a few days ago. Also, we ought to have pilotless planes. Virtually every aircraft accident that now happens that leads to fatalities is due to pilot error. Uh, things like the very infamous case where the last recorded thing from the cockpit on a uh, plane that had crashed and actually killed quite a few people was, oh, expletive, I've pulled the lever the wrong way. Uh, and this made the plane you know, turn the wrong direction and it crashed and killed all the passengers. Uh, that actually is the kind of thing that causes most accidents. You'd be far better off having the autopilot fly your plane. That is just one technology. That is happening, happening very rapidly. My own prediction is actually that driverless cars will replace uh, human-driven vehicles very, very quickly. Uh, governments may well actually act to uh, impose this through the legislative system simply because of the huge health-saving costs from all those uh, accidents that don't take place. But even if governments don't do it, what is going to happen is that the insurance premia on people who still drive cars manually will go up dramatically because it will be so much more risky. So that's one example of a technology. Another one um, is cultured meat, and more generally, hydroponic agriculture. Here in London in 2013, you had at a conference, uh, quite near here actually, the first ever consumption of a beef burger which had been grown entirely in the lab by a Dutch team. Now, it's been possible to cultivate meat, meat tissue, uh, animal muscle tissue, uh, in the lab since the 1960s. But it's only recently that it's become possible to actually cultivate this in a way that can actually lead to uh, the production of edible meat. Now, right now, that meat is incredibly expensive. It's several hundred times more expensive than Kobe beef, which, of course, is the most expensive kind of meat that there is. But uh, you can predict, using standard economic assumptions and knowing how uh, innovation works, that the cost of this meat will fall exponentially. And what that means is in a few years' time, I predict that it will become really, really strange to eat meat that was once part of a live animal. You will still be eating pork, you will still be eating beef, you will still be eating lamb, you'll probably be eating all kinds of made-up meats that never existed before. Uh, but what you will very seldom do is eat meat that's actually come from a live animal, uh, in the same way that very few people now eat meat that's been acquired by hunting. Now, that again has a whole range of dramatic effects that might not be obvious at first sight. Almost half of all the grain grown on the planet is fed to livestock. That will no longer be necessary. That will free up an incredible amount of land, uh, which can be then used for a whole range of other purposes. Most notably, it can be returned to wilderness. You could turn over a huge part of uh, North America back to being prairie, for example. And something which also will contribute to that is hydroponic agriculture and the growth of what is known as vertical farming. Uh, this is where you cultivate uh, arable crops of one kind or another in vertical buildings, those kind of gigantic vertical greenhouses, if you will, using hydroponic techniques. And a whole bunch of techniques which are actually being introduced by a rather specialised class of innovators, people involved in the production of illegal mood-altering substances. 
uh, which is one of the areas where some of the major breakthroughs are being made in this kind of agriculture and the use of things like you know, high-powered UV lamps to encourage plant growth and the like. What this means is that effectively, we will soon be able to feed the world's entire population with 10% of the land use that we now have. And again, you just need to consider what that would actually mean. And again, I emphasize, this is not an elaborate production. This is something we can see happening within a very short space of time. Another thing uh, is something which I constantly tell audiences where there's a lot of young people like this one. Uh, and some of you will have heard me say this before, and it's something I'm becoming quite known for, which is that I believe that quite confidently, I'm absolutely about as certain as I can be, that the majority of you will live to be at around 800 years. Uh, that's because I think that in the next 20 to 30 years, uh, we will successfully resolve the aging problem. Uh, we will work out how to initially stop arrest and then subsequently actually reverse the aging process. Now, that doesn't mean people are going to live forever. It just means that people will no longer die from aging or age-related uh, illnesses, uh, such as most cancers, for example. What they will still die from is things like non-age-related illnesses, uh, homicide, suicide, accident, things of that sort. And using you know, the standard actuarial tables that uh, life insurance companies use already, it works out that the average life expectancy will then become between 700 and 900 years. Uh, now, if you lead an incredibly risk-averse life, uh, you know, you'll probably live for a couple of thousand years uh, until you leave the house one day and get struck by a meteorite or something like that. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you are much more risk-loving, if you're the kind of person who likes to try claiming, climbing K2, then you'll probably only live 50 years, uh, because, you know, obviously, you're engaging in highly risky activity. But the average will be several hundred years. And again, you hardly need to stop and think. This puts the whole kind of arguments about pensions and an aging population that you've just heard of into perspective. Now, one of the reasons actually why I am confident this is going to happen, apart from the intellectual background, is simply because there's such an incredibly acute and powerful financial incentive on governments and private industry to find some way of arresting and reversing aging because of the huge costs that an aging population is going to uh, impose upon uh, society at large through government funding, government costs, and all the things you heard from Mike and Christian. Uh, and there are all kinds of other techniques and technologies that are constantly being discovered. One of the most arresting ones was a discovery announced uh, from a team here in the United Kingdom a few months ago, which was that they'd identified a way of reversing the buildup of waste uh, products in muscle tissue and the aging of muscle tissue, which is one of the big five aging processes. Uh, rather grimly, the way that you could do this was by giving people uh, injections of the blood of younger people. Uh, this is known in the trade, I believe, as the bartery effect. Um, however, uh, this doesn't mean that suddenly vampire fiction is all going to become true to life, because the scientists had also identified the active agent that was responsible for this, uh, and it's perfectly possible to synthesize it. Um, then there's a whole number of other things. One that I gather has already been mentioned here is the whole question of artificial intelligence and robots. Now, I'm not a believer in the kind of ideas that Ray Kurzweil has that we're going to have a singularity in which, in the very near future, we will develop sentient artificial intelligences which will basically be godlike in their knowledge and power, and we've just got to hope that they think of us as being cute pets uh, rather than pests. I actually don't think that's going to happen, uh, mainly because I think the people who foresee this happening uh, are confusing, I think, two quite different things, one of which is intelligence, the other being self-awareness. They're not the same. What we are going to have, undoubtedly, though, is intelligent machines. They just won't be self-aware. Now, what does that mean, though? Well, it means that an incredible range of jobs are going to be automated. A huge range of economic functions will be performed by robots or by intelligent software. It's going to transform education. It's going to transform, because it means, for one thing, it will get away with the part of the job that most academics hate the most, uh, which is grading papers. Uh, that can easily be done by AI software. Uh, it'll also transform medicine, because, amongst other things, uh, the great bulk of standard diagnostic uh, work can be done again by intelligent software. No need to go and see the doctor. 
uh, you can you know, just simply sort of talk to uh, a program, if you will, which is probably more responsive and receptive to what you want than the average doctor's receptionist. Now, that kind of thing is going to, as again, obviously completely change your lives in all sorts of ways. There's a number of other things which I don't have time to talk about here, but which I'll flag up. Things like, for example, 3D printing, which is going to utterly change the way manufacturing is carried out. Amongst other things, it's going to lead to radical decentralization of manufacturing, because it means that you will no longer need to buy a manufactured product made from in a great big factory somewhere. You can simply download a design, and if you have a 3D printer, you can then print the thing off yourself. So that will be a totally different kind of world. Another one is human enhancement. Uh, the use of various kinds of procedures, medications, and the like, to radically enhance human capability, to make people s far smarter, uh, but also perhaps more beautiful, uh, more physically fit and able uh, than would be possible naturally. Uh, this is a thing which has already been developed and again uh, will, you know, I believe, happen very, very rapidly in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. Another is peer-to-peer -peer networking and the development of networks which will, I think, eliminate a huge chunk of the current financial services industry because banks essentially only exist for many of the purposes they now meet because uh, there is a need for a middleman due to the high transactions costs uh, of connecting lenders and borrowers. But that will no longer be true because of modern technology. And things like peer-to-peer -peer lending, which currently are very small but growing exponentially, will become the norm. Peer-to-peer -peer networking also means that the whole energy supply sector will be again totally transformed. And the old idea of the centralized top-down utility, which underlies so much of our politics and regulation, will just vanish completely. So there's all these kind of things happening. And what they mean, of course, is that you're going to have a world that's totally transformed. This is a hell of a lot more than a mere change in policy or a tweak in the tax system or a change in the national minimum wage. You're talking about technologies here that are going to make a totally different world that mean that the world that you will be living in when you're 20 years, certainly 30 years older than you are now, will be unrecognizable compared to the world that you are in now. But it will also be a world that is vastly richer, that is vastly more, has far more opportunities, uh, and is far more flexible and varied. Now, two final, two, three final points. People will tell you this is unprecedented. Well, actually, no, it's not. Uh, your great-grandparents, who lived through a similar kind of period of change like that in the late 19th century, just think about what happened between 1870 and roughly 1910. You got the invention of the internal combustion engine the discovery of the use of electricity, the electric light bulb, uh, the creation of uh, heavier-than-air transport with the first, very first flight just before World War I, the invention of artificial uh, materials like plastics, artificial rubber. And really, all that we've done in most of the 20th century and uh, until a few years ago is work out the details of all those technological innovations uh, and others I could mention, like the telephone and the telegraph, that took place in the late 19th century. We're about to see another great wave of innovation like that one that took place then, and it's going to have just as huge a transformative effect. Second point to make is, when you think about all the vision, the transformative vision that is to be found in places like Silicon Valley, and the other parts of the world where people are thinking about these kind of transformative technologies, you can't help drawing the contrast with politics. There is huge vision for utopian and radical change, if you like, uh, in the worlds of commerce, business, technology these days, whereas politicians are increasingly simply administrators uh, who compete on promises about who can run the state more efficiently. Now, that's actually an enormous improvement. Because when you have politicians with utopian visions of change, the usual result is millions of people being killed. Uh, whereas when you have people in business and technology with that kind of vision, the usual result is that human life is changed for the better, uh, and in often ways that nobody expects or predicts. Finally, what you will find also is an enormous amount of resistance to this change. And that, in a way, is the real political battle of the next 20 to 30 years. What you now have is an extremely powerful ideology which says that you should not do any of these things because of something called the precautionary principle, 
which basically means that you should not do anything new if there is a chance that it might go wrong or it might have a bad effect somewhere, sometime. Now, just think what the world would be like now if that kind of principle had guided public policy in the late 19th and early 20th century. We would not be enjoying the kind of world, the kind of comforts that we now have. I would rather argue for something that uh, someone I, I used to know quite well and still sort of communicate distantly, Max Moore, called the proactionary principle. The idea that what you want to actually do is think about social problems and head them off through innovation. And it's innovation that is the key. That is why the modern world is rich uh, with people who live longer and lead more varied and more fulfilled lives than in any other time in history. It is innovation that is the key to the modern market economy. And it's innovation that is going to not only save the world, but transform the world and make it better. And so what we must do, at almost any cost really, is to prevent the sort of neo-Luddites and the technophobes from stopping these kind of changes from taking place or from, from delaying them. Because that's actually something that will harm human well-being enormously. Uh, in fact, in almost beyond ways of calculating it. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I hope that uh, this has made you do a few bits of research on this. So I'll take questions.